Welcome everybody. Welcome to Mary's. Uh, it is good to have you here. It is good to be together, uh, albeit virtually. This is indeed an important time, and it is a time when we need to remember the presence of the Spirit in the midst of all that life brings. What I know is that the Spirit is trustworthy, that it guides us through, um, and that it gives us strength at times when life can be a bit confusing. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, I am grateful for all of you. And let us prepare for worship by opening our hearts and receiving God's love. Amen. <laughs> be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son came into the world that we might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom where he lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Wisdom. Wisdom is radiant and unfading, and she is easily discerned by those who love her and is found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. One who rises early to seek her will have no difficulty for she will be found sitting at the gate. To fix one's thoughts on her is perfect understanding. 
and one who is vigilant on her account will soon be free from care. Because she goes about seeking those worthy of her, and she graciously appears to them in their paths and meets them in every thought. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. O oh Lord, make haste, make haste to help me. who take pleasure in my misfortune draw back and be disgraced oh lord make haste make haste to help me let those who say to me say forever great is the Lord O Lord make haste make haste to help me but as for me I am poor and needy come to me Terry. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who were left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Truth from the earth. 
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and sleep, slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet. But the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Help us, O oh Lord, to be masters of ourselves, that we might become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. How do you interpret a parable? Well, there's no easy answer to that. In fact, there's probably no one way to interpret every single parable. In the Gospels, Jesus says that he speaks in parables so that people will not understand him. Now, that seems like a strange thing to say. But I think what Jesus means by that is that if he spoke directly to people, if he spoke straight to them, they would not be able to accept what he had to say. It would be too harsh. It would shake them out of their complacent understanding of what it means to be a follower of God. And so he, he speaks in parables, parables which can be interpreted later on as people grow in their ability to be open to new revelations from God. In Matthew's Gospel, the arrangement of parables is often in sets of three, and following the parables, there's often a discourse by Jesus that while it may not be exactly a way to interpret the parables, gives us at least some clue as to what the parables might mean. It's important to remember that parables are not like either a straight narrative, which tells a story about what has happened, nor are they prophetic statements about things that will happen. I think at most, parables are about things that could happen. So this morning's parable about the wise and the foolish virgins who are waiting for the bridegroom to come is the first of three parables in chapter 25 of Matthew's Gospel. So this first parable is about young women, young women who may or may not be thinking ahead to the future. The wise virgins obviously are thinking ahead. They've got plenty of oil, and they know that if the bridegroom is late and doesn't arrive until after dark, they've got oil, 
they could light their lamps, and they could help him find the way to the wedding banquet. The foolish virgins are not thinking that far ahead. They bring their torches and they'll just wait and see what happens. Maybe they'll need them, maybe they won't, and if, if they do, well, they can borrow some of the oil from the wise virgins. Well, it doesn't turn out that way, of course. The wise virgins are wise, and they say, we need all the fuel that we've got. You need to go someplace else to buy it. The second parable in chapter 25 of Matthew's Gospel is a story about a man who owns a large estate. He's obviously rich, and he's going away for an extended period of time, maybe a vacation, maybe a business trip, who knows? That's not important. But what he does is to take some of his wealth, probably just a small amount, but he takes it and gives it to three of his servants, figuring that, well, Maybe while he's away, he can make a little bit of money. And so the first one, he gives 10 denarii, and the servant invests it, and lo and behold, makes 10 more. Second servant is given five denarii. He invests it, makes five more. The third servant is just given one denarii. Now that in itself tells you something. The servant, you know, may not be quite as ambitious as the other two. And in fact, he does not invest it. He buries it. And so he says very proudly when the owner returns, look, here's your, your denarii back. I didn't lose it. So you should be happy. Well, obviously, the master of the house is not happy. He wanted a return on his money. The third parable is perhaps the most significant, certainly the one that seems the most direct. It is a story about the end of time when the king, that's all the identification we have of this figure, the king comes and gathers all the sheep and the goats. Now it is tempting when trying to interpret a parable as to say that, oh, this, the, the sheep are this group and the goats are that group. But we need to wait, wait, see how the parable works out. And he tells the, the, the sheep, you know, that he's going to reward them because when they saw him hungry, they fed him. When they saw him sick, they cared for him. And they all scratch their heads and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, when did this happen? And then comes the zinger. Whenever you did it for the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. And then he gets to the goats and says, you know, when I was sick, you didn't, you didn't take care of me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. And again, they scratch their heads and say, well, when did we see you sick or hungry? He says, whenever you didn't do it for the least of my brethren, you didn't do it me. These are three parables about groups of people who have not acted the way Jesus expects his followers to act. The first group are people who just don't think ahead. They don't plan for the future. In the second parable, the last servant, doesn't seem to have any ambition at all, doesn't want to take any risks. The third one is about people who either understand what Jesus has said about loving God and loving your neighbor. One group seems to understand that, that loving neighbor is a way of loving God second group doesn't quite get it. But in chapter 26, Matthew says, when Jesus finished saying these things, 
he said to his followers, you know, I'm not going to be around forever. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. and There I'll suffer and die. One of the things that all of these parables have in common is that there are people who are being judged, who are being told, sometimes just because of the consequences of their actions, they're being told what they did wrong. What's important to see, however, is that Jesus, too, is being judged. He is being judged according to the standards of the world, according to the standards of the Roman Empire. I mean, the reason Jesus was put to death by Pilate was because he's accused of basically flaunting Roman authority. And even though Pilate is portrayed in all the Gospels as trying to save Jesus, ultimately, he can't find a way to exonerate him of that charge. So Jesus, too, is judged. So what might we take away from these parables and this reminder of Jesus, what's going to happen to him? Is that judgment is not the end. That judgment is only a way of coming to alert people that they're on the wrong path, that they're not doing the things that Jesus wants them to do. But the good news is they have a second chance. Jesus is, is condemned to die. He does suffer and die. But and God raises him from the dead. And so, too, all, the, all those other groups have a chance. Remember, the parable of the sheep and the goats is not a prophecy about the future. It's a parable about what could happen if people who purport to follow Jesus ignore the people in need around them. So what does that mean to us? It is clear from what is happening in our country right now it's clear from all of the various crises that are come together that as a race, we have messed up. We have not done what God has asked us to do, to love one another, to be good stewards of creation. But the good news is we have a second chance. This is not the end of the story. Because once the pandemic is under control, we can start dealing with those things that we've gotten wrong. We can start dealing once and for all with the racism that has afflicted our country from the very beginning. We can start dealing with the climate and the way that we, and not just Americans, but the whole human race, has treated creation, has treated nature. We can once again start to learn how to love one another. And the first thing that we need to do is to bring about reconciliation. This country is divided as probably has never been divided before. We need to be able to come together to forgive one another, to start to really listen to each other and discover how it is that we can live together in peace and harmony. That's what Jesus wants for the church. That's what Jesus wants for the world. As followers of Jesus, we have the chance to do that, to bring about peace and harmony. It won't be easy. It won't happen all at once. But we need to make a start. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. I ask for your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Greg, for our presiding Bishop Michael, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for peace for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. As we look back on our recent election, help us to see each vote cast not as a number, but as a person with a human face and heart. Pray for justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for all in authority for the President of the United States, for the Governor of Washington, for our Mayor, for our Police Department, for the Fire Department, for all paramedics and other first responders, for all frontline workers who serve in our hospitals. Pray for those who serve the community. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for an end to prejudice and violence, for those who protest in the cause of justice, for all striving to end the sin of racism in our world. Pray for the beloved community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and for those in prison. For those who have asked for our prayers, Bob Lokama, Liana, Ruth, Kathy, Doris, Aaron, Annette, Mary, Terry, Eric, Linda, Bill, Ada, and Jean and Barb. Jenny, Samantha. For all who suffer from famine, drought, or distress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for our stewardship campaign. Pray that we might all work together to build the kingdom of God. As we hear the stories of those who have given to build our parish community, may we each feel that same call 
pray for our parish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially those who have died violently, who have taken their own lives, and for our family, friends, and neighbors who have died during the pandemic. Pray for those who have died. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, especially the Blessed Virgin Mary, and all whom we remember today. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and on earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts, may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ, amen. I'm Paul Boke and I'm the treasurer here at St. Mary's. I've been asked to briefly provide a financial report to you, as well as to discuss how Holly and I make our decision to give. The finances of St. Mary's have improved over the last few years. This is due to your faithfulness and dedication to St. Mary's and a strong vestry leadership. We are completing the second year of a 10-year commitment to pay off the HVAC loan. Funds have been provided to begin working on the backlog of deferred maintenance. In 2020, the vestry created an endowment fund established with formal rules and patterned after other successful Episcopal church endowments. Despite the pandemic, thanks to your faithfulness, pledges have remained on track through September. Expenses are running slightly below budget. As we enter into the stewardship season, 
we are faced with the question of our ability to call a full-time priest. As things currently stand, factoring in revenues and cost savings, we remain short of our goal to afford a full-time priest by an estimated amount of $75,000. St. Mary's has meant so much for our family. Holly and I were married here. When we moved back 22 years ago to be closer to family, we were welcomed back with open arms. Two of our children were baptized here. Holly worked with the church as a Christian education coordinator for over a decade. Our family has participated in countless activities at St. Mary's. We have met and made many good friends. God has been good to us, granting us good health and prosperity. I wish I could say that my faith has kept pace with, the, with God's generosity, but for me, it's been a continuing education, a journey. Holly and I have learned from you about giving. It is your faithfulness to God that has taught us throughout our lives here that more can be done, that more can be given to not be afraid. Every year after a fair amount of thought and prayer, we come together and have a relatively short conversation where we challenge ourselves to do better. I don't know where you are on your stewardship journey, but I can honestly tell you that God has met us every time. When we have increased our pledge wondering how we were going to do it, it all worked out. For all that we've been through together, I ask you to trust God in this process. Thank you. Just a couple of announcements. Welcome again to St. Mary's. Uh, a couple of things that are coming up. One is that next Saturday, we will be having a Blue Jeans Saturday. Um, this is an opportunity to come by and, and to help out um, cleaning up the grounds around the church and doing a little bit of gardening. Uh, it starts at nine o'clock. Um, bring whatever tools you would like. Uh, we're basically planning on two hour blocks. So you can come at nine, you can come at 11, come whenever. Um, the best idea actually would be to call Donna Pelkey and she can know precisely um, when you plan on coming. Anyway, it'd be great to have you there. It'd be great. It's a great opportunity for us to see each other. Um, bring your mask um, and it will be a socially distance fun event. So I hope you'll plan on coming. Also, we are looking ahead to the Thanksgiving service, which will be on the Wednesday prior to Thanksgiving that evening. And what we want to do is invite whoever would like to, to come by the church starting on November 11th. And what we want to do is record what you're thankful for, what you're grateful for this year in the midst of everything going on. It is indeed important to take stock of what we're grateful for. So we're putting together a collage, a montage. Um, Beth Bowen will be there between noon and one each Wednesday and uh, or you can record them at home that's another possibility and to send them to Beth so we want to get as many people um, involved as possible so I hope you will think about that and come by the church this Wednesday or any other future Wednesday um, anyway it'll be great to see you hope all is well take care and God bless
be with you and also with you lift up your hearts we lift them to the Lord let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right to give him thanks and praise it is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks a holy God source of life and fountain of mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection, open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels, with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we say, Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we fail to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us. And so we violated your creation, abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. 
Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with the blessed Virgin Mary and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor and glory and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. Holy things for holy people. Let's pray. In union, O Lord, Lord, with the faithful faithful at every every altar of your church, church, where the Holy Holy Eucharist Eucharist is now now being celebrated, I desire desire to offer you praise praise and thanksgiving. thanksgiving. I present to you my soul and body with the earnest wish that I may always be united to you And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you and embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Let nothing ever separate you from me. May I live and die in your love. Amen.
for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. May God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh. 